Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, this uh, um, Tyro broadcast on May 17th, 2024. I'm coming to you from New York, um, and we have uh, a really very interesting um, discussion this morning regarding the overuse of thyroid ultrasound. <coughs> it's um, uh, a very interesting and very timely um, uh, discussion about a topic that has implications for patients, implications for clinicians, and um, uh, and very important implications for uh, healthcare systems and healthcare economics. Uh, we're joined this morning by um, our presenter, Dr. Gonzalo Acosta, who is an endocrinologist and assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Endocrinology at the University of Florida. Uh, Dr. Garcia completed his residency at um, uh, Methodist Hospital in Houston and then went to the uh, perform an endocrine fellowship at UCLA. Uh, we welcome him to the Tyro platform um, to present his current opinion um, uh, piece on uh, overuse of thyroid ultrasound. Dr. Dev Abraham is this morning's discussant. He is the Assistant Dean for Faculty Affairs for the uh, Spencer Fox Echo School of Medicine. Um, having received fellowship training in endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic, his clinical practice is at the Huntsman Cancer Institute and the University of Utah. He is the ideal person to discuss this morning's presentation as he has devoted his career to the role of thyroid ultrasound and thyroid management with an emphasis on cost-effective care. Um, and so with that, I would like to hand over the platform to um, uh, Dr. Acosta um, and encourage everyone as always to uh, send in your questions and I will do my best uh, to address those before the end of the hour. So thank you, Dr. Acosta. Thank you, Dr. Abraham and looking forward to your presentations. Thank you. All right, well, um, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Erkin and Tyro, for the invitation to present um, our paper um, in this great forum. And um, I'm pretty sure it will bring up some interesting points for, for discussion. I have no disclosures. So our paper, our paper titled um, Overuse of Thyroid Ultrasound um, is a narrative review on this topic. And uh, pretty much the, the main purpose of this review was to describe the, the trends in the use of appropriateness of thyroid ultrasound in practice and to explore the causes and consequences of excess thyroid ultrasound use and uh, how to fix the problem. And to better understand this problem, I, I think we need some context regarding the, the epidemiologic trends on, in thyroid cancer over the past few decades. So... Um, and I guess we're all familiar now um, with this graph showing this dramatic increase in, in thyroid cancer incidence over the last several decades, uh, particularly uh, small, uh, sorry, low risk disease, as I will show in the in the next uh, few slides. And um, despite this uh, this significant uh, rise, we we've um, we're all familiar too, with that uh, the mortality rates have remained pretty much stable and they have not changed even though um, the the incidence has has spiked um, very dramatically and um, and the five years of uh, relative survival remains uh, near uh, 99 percent and I think this is uh, largely attributed to the increased detection of indolent disease um, although um, you know, I, I think that there's this is not the sole explanation. This is one of the one of the main uh, reasons why we saw this uh, this spike, and I will uh, pretty much review some data um, to support this. So several studies analyzing the the SEER uh, database, which, which is this kind of a very large um, United States uh, database, and um, ha have been done at different uh, time points. Um, this uh, data, this analysis, have shown that um, that over the years, the the rises in thyroid cancer cases have been mainly papillary, and also this is an older paper, but also it showed that mainly the the small tumors have um, the the incidence of the small tumors have increased. So mainly the less than one centimeter or less than two centimeter tumors. So because obviously these tumors were not clinically 
um, significant at the time of diagnosis. It's been more, uh, it's, 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 this phenomenon has been termed more of an epidemic of diagnosis rather than an epidemic of disease. And uh, I think, you know, this, if we go over the years and this kind of SEER uh, data analysis, we, we saw that th this spike became even more prominent in the, in the early 2000s. And um, as, as we all know, this is a problem that affects mainly uh, women and the m major rise in incidence was in this, in this group. And uh, as mentioned before, the mortality rates have uh, basically remained flat over the years. Uh, so we have come to understand that the expanded use of imaging such as ultrasound and particularly ultrasound is the primary culprit of overdiagnosis of thyroid cancer. And uh, further on my on my presentation, I will go over uh, what this entails and what this means and why uh, this is a problem. And uh, we know that the vast majority of thyroid nodules are found incidentally nowadays. Um, up to almost 20% of patients undergoing a CT scan will have a, an incidentally found thyroid nodule. Um, but actually, some studies have shown that up to 60 to 70% of patients undergoing neck ultrasound for whatever other reason or a thyroid ultrasound will have a, a thyroid nodule found incidentally. And the problem is that once we find the nodule, we start this uh, diagnostic and therapeutic cascade that will expose the patient to several risks and in most cases won't provide significant benefits in terms of mortality and quality of life. So when we were writing this paper, we posed um, ourselves some, some questions. So number one, are we diagnosing more thyroid cancer by ordering more ultrasounds? And number two, are we overutilizing the thyroid ultrasound? So to talk about the thyroid ultrasound itself, I think that we can, we can start uh, with a case and I, I'm pretty sure that we've all encountered this uh, situation. Uh, this is a 50 year old female presenting to her endocrinologist asking for a thyroid ultrasound as one of her friends was recently diagnosed with thyroid cancer. She has no family history of thyroid cancer, no papillo neck mass. And she has been told that, that ultrasound is easy, is fast, is cheap, painless, and with no risks because there's no exposure and there's you know nothing involved other than putting the probe in the neck. And her doctor thinks similarly about the ultrasound. And also a patient recently left this person a bad review online due to not ordering not ordering enough tests and then he orders he orders the, the ultrasound and the patient uh leaves the office satisfied and and happy with the you know with the fact that she got the ultrasound and i think that in this situation we've all been there it, it's easier to say yes than to say no so uh, quick a few words uh on thyroid ultrasound i think that you know we cannot um, ignore this is a non-invasive, is a safe procedure, is painless, is widely available. And I think when we use it appropriately, so when we evaluate, when, when we use it to evaluate patients with thyroid nodules and thyroid cancers, I, I think it's invaluable how much information it gives us. So for example, in thyroid nodules, it will help us uh, with the risk stratification based on their sonographic characteristics and also on the selection um, of nodules for a final aspiration biopsy. And nowadays we have you know, guidance from the ATA and TIRETS on what sizes to use and which nodules to biopsy. And in thyroid cancer, also when we use it preoperatively, this, is, this will guide our extent of surgery and post-op, this is one of the most important tools in, in surveillance. So, so again, thyroid, can, uh, thyroid ultrasound is, is, is extremely important in, in the practice of those of us who, who do thyroid nodules and thyroid cancer as our main, um, as our main uh, practice. So although neck ultrasound is, is so, such a good tool, I think it is a blessing and a, cur and a curse because its high sensitivity can uh, lead to the incidental discovery of even the tiniest uh, thyroid lesions, like down to like one to two millimeters. And um, in this study, um, they showed that, again, the prevalence of thyroid nodules were um, almost 65 to 70% if we use this, uh, you know, in the general population. And you, we can see that this is much more common than if in CT scans, MRIs, and, and uh, PET scans. So not only has the thyroid ultrasound and the ultrasound 
technology itself uh, become more uh, or better and more sensitive uh, for finding nodules, but also the, the frequency of thyroid ultrasound use has increased over the years. And I, I would say that it has skyrocketed over the years. And this is one of the most important papers on this topic. And this was by Dr. Haymart and colleagues. And they analyzed a combined SEER Medicare database. Um, they had they included almost uh, more than two million patients. Um, all of them, based on the based on the on the database they were using, were um, older than sixty five years. And this was a predominantly female cohort that had a, also a big proportion of of male patients. And we can see that between two thousand and two and two thousand and twelve. The use of ultrasound as initial imaging, this is not after a CT scan found a nodule, just as initial imaging um, increased at a rate of 21% per year. And they did a, um, a multivariate analysis and after controlling uh, for multiple vari uh, variables, they found that uh, female sex and having one or more, or sorry, more than one comorbidities um, increase the, or were risk factors for getting a thyroid ultrasound. And when they did this uh, multivariate regression analysis, they actually found that the use of thyroid ultrasound by itself, after controlling uh, for all those other factors, were, um, was significantly associated with um, the thyroid cancer uh, incidence. And in terms of the tumor, uh, tumor characteristics, they found that most of the tumors that were found were papillary again, they were localized, and up almost 35% of the tumors were, um, were microcarcinomas. And lastly, when they, they did this uh, fitted model in, in which they, um, using the observed uh, numbers from prior years, they calculated over this, this period of time, um, an excess of more than 6,500 uh, thyroid cancer cases that were um, attributed to the increased use in thyroid ultrasound. Um, one of the problems was that you know, we, we did not get from the paper um, what indications were there for the thyroid ultrasound. But still, I think that um, one of the conclusions is that the findings of the study support uh, overdiagnosis as the primary culprit of the increased thyroid cancer incidence. And uh, the take home message was to um, you know, this need to universally reduce the thyroid ultrasound use. And uh, these findings have been replicated in many studies. I'm just showing this from the, from the VA, um, which again was pretty much similar findings on the increase in the, the thyroid cancer incidence, the ultrasound in, um, rates and the fine needle aspiration uh, numbers. <clears throat> so in this study, as we can see, the incidence of thyroid cancer uh, doubled between 2002 to 2012, so in a span of 10 years, the incidence doubled. But when they looked at the rate of increased use of thyroid ultrasound, they actually found a five-fold increase in, in thyroid ultrasound use in this same period. So again, in this case, the authors argue that um, the increase in thyroid cancer incidence is due to overdiagnosis of subclinical disease. Um, but the, the main problem with this paper was that no tumor characteristics were provided, so we don't know if this cancers were larger, were, you know, like were clinically significant, or they were uh, more subclinical and more, uh, you know, microcarcinomas like the prior study. And I think outside the U.S., we also have a couple of, of great studies, uh, one from South Korea and one from, from Belgium that I think also um, paint the same picture. So in South Korea, I don't know, I, I, I think that most of us are um, aware of this one, but in South Korea, in 1999, the, the Korean government, they started um, this national program for cancer screening. And they screened for pretty much all cancer types. And they included thyroid cancer um, in this program just for a, you know, for a very low uh, add-on fee. So obviously, most people were taking this uh, uh, advantage of this. So as we can see, by 2011, the rate of thyroid cancer diagnosis was 15 times higher than um, in 1999 when the program started. And um, as always, as you know, consistently shown, the thyroid cancer mortality pretty much remained uh, unchanged. Um, they also found a strong correlation uh, between the proportion of the population screened, and this was, they compared uh, uh, per region. So the proportion of population screened 
and the, ins and the regional incidence of thyroid cancer. But I think in this case, the, the real problem is not finding or, or the increase in the incidence. The problem is what we're doing with this uh, cancers when we diagnose them. So um, thyroid cancer became the most common type of cancer in South Korea. And all of the patients were being treated with surgery. And up to two thirds of them were getting total thyroidectomies. The other third uh, were treated with partial thyroidectomies. And the surgery for uh, microcarcinoma, so for tumors less than one centimeter, went from 14% to 56% in a span of 10 years. And 11% of patients developed hypoparathyroidism. So, and, and I think we, we have all um, you know, dealt with this problem. We know this, is, this affects the quality of life of the patient significantly. So obviously this is very, very, um, this is a, something we need to avoid as we can. And uh, as the South Korean data show, all it takes to expose this reservoir is ultrasonographic screening. And this is what the authors share as well. If countries want to prevent their own epidemic, they will need to discourage early thyroid cancer detection. And uh, Belgium's example is another, uh, is another good one. And uh, this is, you know, I had to learn this to, to write this paper, but um, it, it's like Belgium is, is divided in two different, um, in two major regions, uh, Flanders to the north and Wallonia to the south. And these regions are completely different linguistically, culturally, politically. And uh, we can see this heat map on the thyroid cancer incidence. We have females on the left, males to the right. So you can see that the thyroid cancer incidence varies significantly between regions. And the authors of this paper called the, the southern region, Wallonia, the high incidence region, and the northern region, Flanders, the low incidence region. When they compare the, the rates of neck ultrasound use, you can see the difference between both uh, regions. And this also was observed in terms of the thyroid surgery numbers. <clears throat> um, so although the incidence was uh, more than twice uh, that in Wallonia, so in the, the high incidence region and the lower in incidence region, the, the main differences um, on, in, between the groups were in papillary thyroid cancers, T1, so less than two centimeter tumors, but ma mainly those uh, on the microcarcinoma, so size less than one centimeter. So again, I think um, most of these studies are drawing the same conclusions over and over. So, so some key concepts on this, um, on this point that the thyroid ultrasound use has increased over the years not only in the US, but also worldwide. And the increased use of thyroid ultrasound is associated with increased thyroid cancer detection, especially low risk cancers that if left untreated probably will have very low impact in morbidity and mortality. And these findings raise concern for over utilization of thyroid ultrasound. So because if we're talking about over utilization, that means that there are scenarios or situations where we should be using thyroid ultrasound, but and this will call appropriate um, use of thyroid ultrasound. But we will have um, other scenarios which the use of ultrasound is inappropriate. And this is just kind of part of the review that, that, that we did. This is kind of the, the, the larger groups I, I think that are considered to be inappropriate. So primary hypothyroidism, nonspecific neck symptoms without a palpable mass, also screening for uh, thyroid cancer in non-high risk groups and uh, positive TPO antibodies. And this specific topic of appropriateness or inappropriateness of thyroid ultrasound use was actually um, evaluated in a systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, this study included seven studies, all observational, um, almost 1,500 patients included. And the problem is that the, the, the appropriateness criteria was very heterogeneous. Some studies use clinical practice guidelines for which um, we don't have many expert opinion and author interpretation of the literature. And this study found that up to 46% of ultrasounds or thyroid ultrasounds were considered inappropriate. And again, this rates change based on the definition we use. But this paper not only found that the use of ultrasound was inappropriate in many, many uh, cases, but also that we do not have a very well standardized definition of what an appropriate ultrasound is. So that was, I think that's, a, that's a, an opportunity for improvement in, in terms of, of clinical care. Um, but I, I was, personally, I was not aware before writing this, this uh, before doing this review, but 
you know, there are, there's, there are a couple of guidelines out there. Um, this one from ACE and the ACE equivalent in Italy, a part of their thyroid nodule guidelines, they um, add this small um, section on when to perform thyroid ultrasound. And they recommend it for patients who are at risk for thyroid malignancy. And they mention a, a few uh, risk factors, patients that have palpable thyroid nodules or goiter, or patients that have uh, palpable lymphadenopathy suggestive of, of malignant lesion. And um, the American College of Radiology also came, um, um, also published this appropriateness criteria. And they go over a few uh, situations where thyroid ultrasound use is appropriate, such as you know, palpable thyroid nodule or pre-op um, evaluation of, of thyroid cancer. But, but they add this small paragraph on um, that there is no role of ultrasound in the evaluation of hypothyroidism. So I think that's, that's an important point to make. And the American College of Radiology also provides some guidance on what to do or when to order a thyroid ultrasound when we find these thyroid nodules incidentally on CT scan or MRI. So basically this is also kind of part of this, um, part of this guidance that is not super available out there. So in terms of appropriateness of thyroid ultrasound, I think the main issue is that there's no universal definition of what constitutes an inappropriate thyroid ultrasound. And um, this just impacts the, the frequency of, or the rates that we can calculate of how, how often this is happening. And I think decreasing the inappropriate use of thyroid ultrasound is very important to decrease the, the potential risks of thyroid cancer, um, mainly overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So this leads me to my next point, which is what are the consequences of thyroid ultrasound overuse? And I think we can all agree that when used with, uh, you know, using the appropriate clinical indications, this will provide optimal patient care, as I said, for nodules and thyroid cancer, but when used inappropriately, this will have several negative consequences, which will impact the patient in, and the health system in different ways. And going back to this kind of cascade, right? I mean, we do an ultrasound that is inappropriate. We will end up finding nodules because of this large reservoir. This will lead to more things done to the patient. So FNA and diagnosis of cancer, right? So this will lead to this thyroid cancer overdiagnosis. And then all the things we're gonna do to the, to the cancer itself. So surgery, radioactive iodine, TSH suppression, and we increase the risk of overtreatment of these cancers that, again, if uh, that this can be associated with unnecessary harms. So just um, touching a little bit on overdiagnosis, what's the definition of overdiagnosis? Uh, this is when a lesion fulfills pathologic criteria for cancer, but does not go on to cause symptoms or death. And we, we need two pre prerequisites to, um, to have overdiagnosis. Number one is a silent disease reservoir, which as we know in thyroid and nodules of thyroid cancer, we have a large reservoir out there and activities leading to its detection. So if we talk about thyroid cancer, right, we have this large res reservoir and now we are adding this uh, increased use in thyroid ultrasound every year. And we're gonna end up with this graphs that we're seeing pretty much across the world um, without really um, affecting the mortality rates or likely um, you know, impacting the, the quality of life of the patient long-term. And this is a problem not, I guess this is a problem worldwide, right? And this was a very fancy study and I'm probably gonna um, you know, extremely uh, simplify this, the findings and, and the, the methods they use for, for this study, but pretty much um, the, the authors of this paper modeled the expected rates of thyroid cancer by age group over the years using observed rates. Um, and this was from an international database. And uh, pretty much they found that um, in the US, thyroid cancer overdiagnosis affects eight out of 10 women and five out of 10 men diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Um, and this is, again, this is using this projected model. So this was, obviously it has its flaws, but you know, definitely um, if we would have used the observed rates before this epidemic of thyroid ultrasound use started, um, things would have stayed pretty much, uh, you know, very different than, than this. 
And in terms of thyroid cancer over treatment, I think that we are all aware of the risks of of pretty much um, all interventions for thyroid cancer, so um, for so thyroid surgery, and you know this risk of permanent hypoparathyroidism. That I, I think we can all agree that these numbers are usually um, you know in, in real life they're they're higher than than what is reported. Um, radioactive iodine therapy can cause uh, dry mouth um, issues with the lacrimal ducts, and this very low but but apparently real risk of second primary malignancies. Obviously, we um, we put the patient on lifelong um, levothyroxine therapy and the risks of TSH oversuppression. And not only you know we have the health related risks such as overdiagnosis and overtreatment, we also have the economic burden of all these thyroid cancers that we're diagnosing, and uh, the financial toxicity associated with thyroid cancer diagnosis. I think it, it's it's real. And uh, you know, I think this is this is not a surprise that all patients with cancer, like in general, have a higher risk of bankruptcy compared to those without cancer. And uh, the thyroid is not the exception. Um, this study showed that patients with thyroid cancer have a, a two to four uh, fold risk of bankruptcy that, uh, compared to the to controls. And this has also been shown in a more kind of public health system. Um, level and this uh, study from Brazil, um, I think, showed the same trend. Right, more use of ultrasound, more use of FNA, more diagnosis of cancer, more surgeries, and overall, they saw um, over the past several years this um, rise or this increase, significant increase in in costs related to thyroid nodule investigation and costs related to thyroid cancer treatment. And obviously, we cannot forget all the quality of life implications of a cancer diagnosis. And, um, you know, this, this quality of life implications uh, affect the patient in, in, in different kind of spheres. And we know that the, the emotions associated with the cancer, the, all the logistics required for follow-up, for labs, for ultrasounds, all the, you know, the TSH suppression, and obviously, if, if any of the complications happen, such as the recurrent lary laryngeal nerve injury or hypoparathyroidism, we've all seen it. The quality of life of the patient really uh, is, gets really impaired for the rest of, of this patient's life. And I'm just adding this for, um, you know, for reference. When we use inappropriate um, uh, ultrasound inappropriately, we do not get much benefit, but we expose the patient to significant harms. So just um, this is, I think, the part of the, the talk where you know, we can review or we can discuss what is leading to this excess use of thyroid ultrasound. And I think you know, there are three main, um, you know, the three main groups of, of, of drivers. One is the, are the, the, the physicians or you know, the, the professional medicine culture, the clinician attitudes, clinician beliefs about the risks and benefits of ultrasound. Then we have the patient's uh, you know, um, experience and also factors that, that may lead for, for them to want an ultrasound and also this more system-based or more like practice environment. And from a clinician standpoint, I think that, you know, we, we as I said, there's no great guidance on what is a clinically supported indication and what is um, and what is not. So is you know this is this general lack of awareness of what is a good indication or not and also lack of awareness of what might happen down the road if we find a nodule and we go down the route this route we're exposing the patient to harms that we do not consider when we're um, ordering the, the test and obviously there's all uh, this fear of litigation negative patient feedback that you know if we do not um, order the ultrasound and um, this was a, a survey study done um, on, you know, reported misuse of thyroid ultrasound. And this was done in pretty much um, endocrinologists, PCPs, surgeons involving thyroid cancer care. And when they, they classified the responses in three main groups, one, the clinically supported group, the clinically unclear, and the not clinically supported. And I think the more, uh, the most surprising finding was that this, this, um, uh, clinicians that were that are involved in thyroid cancer care would um, actually re um, uh, order an ultrasound almost 35% of the cases per patient request 
for abnormal thyroid function tests and positive thyroid antibodies. So I think we can all agree these are not clinically supported, but it's still happening even in those like closely involved in thyroid cancer care. And this affects pretty much every single um, setting and every single specialty. From a patient perspective, I think this is not, you know, there's not much data behind this, but I think this, this perception that more care is better is one of the main drivers. The misconception regarding the benefits of thyroid ultrasound and the expectation of better outcomes with early detection of nodules, um, or for example, understanding why am I gaining weight? Why am I fatigued? Like, you know, can we do more testing to find, uh, find out the cause of these symptoms? And pretty much same, um, the lack of awareness of what can happen if you find a nodule and you go down the route of, of the diagnosis. Finally, the practice environment. You know, some, some healthcare system structures can incentivize getting more tests. And one of those tests can, can involve like thyroid ultrasound. This can be a source of revenue. And also, and I, I guess this is more like a personal and uh, our personal take is that, you know, some thyroid specific clinics you know, there, you need to find nodules to to do uh, to operate and to do more things. And and again, we cannot. This is just to show you that you know, one ultrasound will bring RVUs, will bring uh, revenue, and will bring money to the system. So finally, how do we reduce um, the overuse of thyroid ultrasound? So, you know, this thyroid ultrasound overuse is a low value care practice. What does it? What does this mean? Um, a low value care practice is an intervention that results in no or minimal benefit for patients, but exposes them to unnecessary harm and cost. And by decreasing the inappropriate use of thyroid ultrasound, we are improving quality of care. So this is what we need to strive for. We need to not decrease the thyroid ultrasound use, uh, the thyroid ultrasound use in general. We need to decrease the inappropriate use of thyroid ultrasound. And to do this, we need to um, we need to de-implement this. Um, this intervention. And what does in the implementation mean? This is a process of abandoning practice practices that are not effective or potentially harmful. And this de-implementation uh, de is a science um, on itself, but, and there are different frameworks for this, but um, I think this is one of the, the, the best frameworks I, I could find and the one that I think that is being more, uh, more generally used when trying to de-implement certain strategies strategies. And number one, we need to understand the con contributing factors and the context. Um, we need to select the appropriate level of restriction for the practice. And lastly, we need to develop and implement strategies to support this implementation. So in the case of thyroid ultrasound or, or thyroid ultrasound overuse, we know that the drivers for this or the contributing factors are multi-level clinicians, patients, and the system. Um, when we try to restrict we need to restrict the ultrasound use to clinically indicated, um, clinically indicated um, scenarios. And to implement these strategies, I think policies, sending policies against screening, and mainly, I think this is the most important intervention is uh, raising awareness of the risks of thyroid ultrasound overuse by educating clinicians and educating, edu ed educating patients. I'm just gonna add this to um, the talk, just, you know, just this is a summary of potential interventions um, by each um, group of uh, problems or um, groups of um, uh, factors driving these issues. So some things that we can do, follow the guidelines. The other thing is, this is a statement that came from the United States Preventive Services Task Force um, recommending against screening of thyroid cancer. And this was a statement that they said that the results um, of you know, screening uh, may cause much more harm than benefits in the general population. And lastly, this kind of choosing wisely campaign with the endocrine society, where they, um, this is a statement recommending against thyroid ultrasound use uh, with abnormal thyroid function tests, pretty much the same as the, the other guidelines. And just to share, last slide, this is a successful example of the implementation in thyroid cancer. Uh, and the South Korean group um, termed this turning the tide. And we can see here that, you know, that the rates of thyroid cancer were increasing with this, um, this screening strategy. But then in, in 2014, this group of 
clinicians called to stop screening because they were they actually noticed the risks and the harms of 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 this of this trend of diagnosing thyroid cancers and treating them and 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 causing uh, problems with the treatment, and uh, they did it by writing these open letters to the public, highlighting that the 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 incidence of thyroid cancer high um, had skyrocketed and proposing that the screening with ultrasonography be discouraged, and they did it through television, newspapers, and others. And um, in the in the here in the states, I think that. You know, we saw this very, very rapid increase until maybe, and again, this is just an observation. I don't think there's like a, maybe there's a cause and effect um, here, but, you know, in 2009, the first ATA guidelines, we can start seeing how the, 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 the rate started to, to decrease or the rate of increase started to decrease. Then in 2015, the ATA guidelines, and we can start seeing that the downslope a little bit, and then the tyrants came out in 2017. So, so again, this strategy is more awareness, more education of patients and clinicians will, uh, will get us there. So to conclude, uh, the frequency of use of thyroid ultrasound has increased in the US and up to 40% or 40 to 50% of them um, are performed without strong clinical indications. And the overuse of ultrasound is associated with overdiagnosis of thyroid cancer. And we've discussed what this exposes patients to, this, this harm from a health, standpoint, financial standpoint, and also quality of life standpoint. We need to implement, um, or sorry, we, we need to develop effective de-implementation strategies to help mitigate this problem. And I think my main take home uh, message is that we need to select patients more carefully for thyroid ultrasound, just like we do with CT scans because of the risk of, um, of uh, of radiation exposure or MRI because of the cost or PET scans, I think this is a something that we need to we need to do more carefully, knowing the risks. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and uh, and happy to discuss in the Q and A. Great, uh, Dr. Abraham. So um, it's a great talk, Dr. Krista. Uh, covered it very thoroughly. So I'm I'm going to focus on a couple of things. Um, one is uh, to review the problem of overdiagnosis, some of the things that I wanted to particularly focus on what actually happened during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in specific. So the inappropriate use of uh, ultrasound is probably a tip of the iceberg. The larger proportion is a fortuitously, fortuitously identified thyroid nodules. Those are genuine disease, um, which is subclinical, of course which is a much larger fraction. And this was elegantly showed by Dr. Uh, Mazafar in the 90s. Uh, I, I absolutely uh, like to read all the papers. And he elegantly uh, proved that ultrasound evaluation and autopsies obviously were superior to palpation. And this study is a meta-analysis which revealed the presence of subclinical disease in vast numbers. And if you look at the Finnish study, as much as a 35% uh, incidence or uh, prevalence of microcarcinomas in autopsy series that they looked at. So I tried to look for data regarding how many ultrasounds are being done in the US. And I was unable to find complete information. And this is the insurance-based um, care provided in the US, 50% um, plus is employment-based in private insurance. There's absolutely no data you can get that's accurate enough. What I could find is Medicare uh, data that was elegantly analyzed by the, the group of authors in this slide, in this study, uh, where they looked at insurance submissions using a provider utilization and, and payment data. They used the code 76536, which is the ultrasound code. And out of the 18% or 19% or so Medicare uh, participants, about 700 ultrasounds were done per, in the year 2019. And out of which about 17% of those, 134,000 were performed by uh, endocrinologists, 
and the vast majority are still performed by radiologists. So even if you extrapolate from this data, we are doing about four or five million ultrasounds. So we already heard about the mode of detection of thyroid nodules, but I'd like to bring everyone's attention to the CT scans of the chest, because we have gone up from 3 million chest CT scans in 1980s to 80 million, 80 million CT scans in 2020. And this is the equivalent of uh, bycatch of commercial fishing is how I see it. Um, here is uh, the Utah cancer data. The top four are screened cancers. And if you look at the uh, uh, bottom four that I uh, picked, uh, these cancers, even though they are not subject to active screening, they go through fortuitous screening, uh, which I would like to describe it as. Because incidentally, during chest CT, ironically, I was speaking with my uh, urology colleagues, they detect more often renal tumors on chest CT because it cuts through one or two of the sections in the upper portion of the kidney and it gets picked up. So the kidney, these are not screen tumors. Um, and if you, if you remember, brain and nervous system cancers were pretty much lethal, but now there is a large surviving fraction because these are all meningioma patients that are picked up fortuitously. So we're gonna see this in all cancers because of this concept of um, imaging um, first, deal with it later approach. And this, I used to work at the VA for years and these sort of studies, even though illustrate very elegantly how ultrasound increases um, detection, but shouldn't come as a surprise to us. Why? Because it's the ultrasound guided fine needle aspiration is the final common pathway of uh, evaluating thyroid nodules. It's like saying we are all doing cytology. So it doesn't make sense to me. Um, in investment circle, there is a um, expression called there is no alternative during down market. You have to be in the market. So it's called TINA. TINA applies to uh, thyroid nodules also. There is no other alternative. Once you diagnose a, a nodule and you call it a tumor, patients want evaluations. So it is very complicated question. It cannot be answered with a simple yes or no. Obviously we know that led to over diagnosis across the world. And it also engineered a, a very, uh, provocative titles like this. Is it time to turn off the ultrasound? Very dramatic. It gets your attention. Um, so we heard about the uh, Korean data, but I was more interested in is what is the population at that time? It was about 50 million. So 40,000 cases were diagnosed that year with uh, a population of 50 million. And their guidelines of biopsy to threshold is much smaller. So in the US ACR guidelines is about 10 millimeters. They allow biopsy up to five millimeters. So it's much smaller. Uh, that should also be mentioned. So how are we doing in the US? So out of 330 million, we diagnose about 44,000 cases. Not quite in the same epidemic proportions that we saw in South Korea, but we are slowly getting there. That is the difference between what happened in South Korea and what's happening in the US. So we do about uh, 600,000 to 650,000 biopsies, out of which 150,000 thyroid surgeries are accomplished. Some are done for diagnostic purposes. Um, the concept of mutation testing has influenced who gets submitted for surgery but that's a discussion for another day. The complication rates are a problem. Uh, mortality is quite low in these patients. We already heard that from Dr. Krista. Vast majority, 90% of the cases are less than two centimeters, i.e. stage one. So we also heard about the bankruptcy risk. Is What we didn't hear about is, if you look at the strata of people who go bankrupt, it is dominated by younger population. And the reason for that is they are young, 
they're starting a family. I hear this every day. I have two small children, less than five years of age. Am I going to die? It is absolute fear that drives these evaluations in young people. And they're starting out in their career, their young families, their finances is stretched, and this diagnosis tips them over. So in younger people, it makes even more sense to uh, be judicious about uh, doing testing. So we heard about the uh, uh, turn in the tide, but the coalition of physician group is the most impressive I've ever seen in any health uh, care ad, uh, application in my 25 years. This you know, absolutely proves that we can all come together and come to an agreement, not by guidelines alone, but by just making a conscious effort of individual soul searching and application of what is right for our patients. So I wanted to see what happened during COVID and data is still coming out and I'm absolutely interested in looking at this uh, through our group. Uh, we are in the process of it, but it has already been done by the population science group and they put it as a, a PowerPoint presentation. Absolutely fantastic data out there. Everybody should review it. And um, this is an unprecedented situation to assess what human behavior can do. We, there was lockdown. We were terrified to go to hospitals, let alone uh, not being able to get care. And that showed an abrupt drop in the diagnosis of all cancers. And if you look at the breakdown, the greatest drop was actually in the bottom uh, left of your screen. A 71% reduction in the diagnosis of thyroid cancers. And the authors actually conclude the incidence rate declined highest for thyroid cancer, uh, which was followed by screen cancers. And the incidence rates didn't rebound or surpass the pre-pandemic levels. So in other words, uh, there is a delay in catching up is what I think it is. Uh, and the decline was most for cancer types that are detected uh, uh, by the sort of fortuitous screening and screen cancers. Those cancers that are detected by symptoms, i.e. pancreatic cancer, uh, et cetera, they were not delayed. There was a very, very modest decline. So in other words, patients who are symptomatic with cancer got diagnosed, which is a good thing. Um, the largest decline, which is very interesting, and I would like to look into this even more, the largest decline was seen in the more affluent counties which tells me that they were so scared to come to hospital, they delayed um, uh, other imaging related to thyroid, so on and so forth. So is sonogram the problem? Overdiagnosis, obviously. Um, I really find it hard to blame the ultrasound um, uh, systems. They've become better, and I've done ultrasounds from late 90s onwards. The resolution has gone up, which has led to early detection of uh, lymphadenopathy, more complete surgeries, early recurrences, et cetera. So I can't blame the ultrasound systems. It's like saying we're doing too many cytology. We need to cut back on doing cytology. We do it because we are forced to do it. It's more uh, realistic uh, uh, conclusion. So I would say follow clinical guidelines, uh, practice active surveillance whenever possible, which may include not biopsying the patient and doing ultrasounds, which is actually a lesser um, evil, lesser of the evil, if you ask me. Um, provider education, bulk of the evaluation is done by radiology through primary care referrals. Endocrinologists play a much smaller role than I thought uh, would happen from the Medicare data that was reviewed earlier on. Um, I think AI and deep learning, machine learning is uh, important, but above all, public education and physician coalition formation, at least regional, regionally, will curtail this uh, overdiagnosis epidemic. So I conclude by saying, uh, don't throw the baby out with the uh, uh, bath water. Um, that's my last slide. Great. Um... Terrific. 
Thank you both very much. Um, really fascinating discussion here. We do have one uh, comment from our uh, one of our listeners, and this is from a physician um, who reports that in 2020 he under he was seen by an otolaryngologist because of swallowing issues. He had a sore throat, a deviated uvula, uh, neck pain, choking sim um, symptoms. Um, at that time, at the end of the appointment, the dollar the doctor asked, "When um, are you?" even coming, when are you even coming here? Why are you even coming here? Uh, this, and in 2022, I felt a lump and the family physician ordered an ultrasound which showed a 3.6 centimeter benign appearing he, uh, check. Um, he had a checkup 12 months uh, after that, which, um, uh, which, was it, which was what advised he was ultimately diagnosed with an oncocytic carcinoma. Um, uh, and his claim uh, as a physician um, was that uh, doctors were not educated enough to make the decision um, uh, to use less ultrasound. Obviously, this is a bit of a one-off and a certainly a challenging um, situation. But let me let me circle back here uh, because I think that um, there's there are um, a, a variety of stakeholders when it comes to this decision when to implement. Um, a diagnostic test. But I think we have to look at it um, in, in terms of um, medicine in general and this desire over time to look inside the body and to augment what it is that we can understand and see above and beyond physical exam. And physical exam is really that lost art. Um, we're all trained to do it, but as soon as we uh, learn how to perform a, a good um, physical exam, the next step is what's the most, what's a better diagnostic test that's gonna give you more information that's gonna identify problems that your fingers um, and your sight and uh, your ears can't diagnose. And so everything from colonoscopy to echocardiography to fiber optic laryngoscopy, you name it. Um, we all want to get a look at the inside of the human body in order to understand more. So my question for you is uh, twofold. Um, is the point of concern the um, understanding what to do with the findings of ultrasound, which as um, the ATA and other organizations have made great efforts to stop performing biopsies for unnecessary, in an unnecessary situation? Or is it really the um, identification of thyroid nodules that um, is at the, at the heart of this problem? Because if we, if, if, and, and let me just sort of segue into that by saying, I've never had a patient who was diagnosed with a thyroid nodule um, complained that they wish they never had an ultrasound that identified that. Now, this may be skewed as a surgeon, but I think it's a really valuable um, point of, of reference here. What becomes contentious is when unnecessary biopsies, unnecessary pursuit of diagnoses for um, otherwise um, uh, uh, innocent looking findings, and, and so that's that. Let me ask Dr. Acosta and Dr. Abraham if you could address that. I hope I've articulated my, um, my question uh, adequately for you to comment here. I, I can go first, Dr. Abraham? Sure. Yeah, please yeah. do, please uh, do. I think, I think that's, a, that's a great point, um, Dr. Erkin. And I think that I think both approaches are need to happen at the same time. I definitely agree that, um, and I think this drop in the incidents we've seen in the past few years after that big rise has been since, you know, I guess, implementing the guidelines on what to biopsy, what not to biopsy, increasing the the, the cutoffs. Um, and I understand the new guidelines from example, uh, for example, uh, by the ATA will, will e even provide more guidance on what nodules not to biopsy just to Kind of help tackle the problem again, um, even even further. But but I think that everything starts with the with the identification of the nodule, 
And I think although we as endocrinologists and I guess surgeons and as we come to, um, I guess, um, implement the guidance on what to biopsy and what to evaluate further, there's still going to be people that will find the nodule and do not follow these recommendations and patients will end up getting it anyway, right? Other than, I mean, despite having good guidance about it. So I think that we definitely need, and I think that the, the major um, way to tackle this problem is with what you said. It's just like, eva like uh, selecting patients better for biopsy and for further evaluation of a nodule that is found incidentally. But I think we can help decreasing the amount of patients that are I guess, prone to the negative consequences of not following that guidance, even more by decreasing the use of, of ultrasound that is not appropriate. So I think it's, you know, just short answer would be, I think both approaches work together. Um, and, and I think that, again, the more we find, the more we'll do, as Dr. Abraham uh, said, as part of his talk. Dr. Abraham, do you want to comment? Yes, I do. Um, so the, the challenge is, once an nodule is diagnosed, or fortuitously screened, primarily with CT scans. CT scans now is the x-rays of the past when I went to medical school. Everybody gets one, almost, if you go to the ER clutching your chest or breathless. So CT scan is, is the number one culprit for overdiagnosis of not only thyroid cancer, but also renal cancer. And subclinical renal cancer is very common. They can also be actively surveilled. The definition of what is fair and what is not is often from the patient's perspective. And they always feel like, okay, the starfish effect. For that starfish, even the physicians feel that. For that starfish, it made uh, a difference. And the case that was uh, uh, presented earlier on um, during the chat uh, question session of a uh, Hertel cell uh, carcinoma um, or oncocytic carcinoma that was overlooked, that cancer must have been present right from there. Uh, that's obvious. It's a larger tumor. I cannot comment on the specifics, but these are often slow-growing tumors They um, and they manifest earlier on. Um, so a physical exam would have Perhaps picked it, I don't know. It's hard to speculate. So if you're going back to physical exam and ignoring uh, the imaging finding, uh, that is not appealing to patients. That won't fly at all, or even to several of uh, the physicians. The guidelines have limitations um, because the data is fairly construed. They're extrapolated. They're not based on long-term solid data. So one can form all the guidelines, but there are limitations if you use the quality factors that go into guideline formation also. As I see it, the best solution is patient and public education. And how often do we hear patients who come and ask us, uh, I want to be uh, cancer-free? And you and I know there is a, that's an unattainable goal in anybody, but that's what patients expect. So the mass education is uh, lacking in the US, public education. And I think that is uh, where I would start. All right, terrific. Well, listen, thank you very much. Um, this has been a fascinating discussion. I'm not sure that we've reached um, a point of, uh, uh, of um, uh, necessarily a conclusion here. Um, but uh, certainly an area that um, needs to be addressed further, and uh, there will be further discussion. I want to thank everybody for joining us today, and um, I also especially want to thank Dr. Acosta and Dr. Abraham for a really wonderful discussion, um, and um, hope that you both will join us again on the Tyro platform. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe and um, uh, be well.